Welcome. My name is Benjamin Hibbert. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, and today I'll be talking to you guys about atrial shunt devices. Will they work? As we're all aware, heart failure affects millions of patients and has an immense economical and symptomatic burden. If we look at the two major forms of heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, epidemiologically, they're about equal in terms of the number of patients that we see. However, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction has multiple drug and device-based therapies that improve symptoms as well as prognosis of heart failure. In contrast, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has limited therapies available beyond diuretics and symptomatic management. When we look at heart failure, it's the number one cause of hospitalization in patients over 65 years of age and has an annual cost of $20,000 per patient. Of these patients, 90% of them present with dyspnea or congestion. Needless to say, this remains a target for both medical and device-based intervention. Elevated left atrial pressure can lead to worsening quality of life and eventual hospitalization. As we can see with the graph showing left atrial pressure on the y-axis and disease progression on the x-axis, there are differences both in baseline loading conditions as well as the changes in left atrial pressure that we see with exertion. Once left atrial pressure rises above a threshold, patients become symptomatic and experience dyspnea. Left unchecked left atrial pressure can continue to rise and eventually lead to decompensated heart failure and need for hospitalization. Interatrial shunts work by reducing the left atrial pressure by directing flow to the low pressure high capacitance venous system. As we can see based on this modeling study, there is an increase in shunt flow as shunt diameter increases. This results in further decreases in capillary wedge pressure and moderate increases in the central venous pressure, which result in compensatory increase in right ventricular cardiac output and decrease in left ventricular cardiac output. Optimal shunt diameter sits around 7 millimeters, resulting in optimal decrease in wedge pressure with minimal increase in right atrial pressure and acceptable loss of left ventricular cardiac output. What started with balloon septostomy and modification of existing atrial septal devices has evolved into dedicated interatrial shunt devices. Currently, there are four devices under investigation for use in humans, the V-Wave device by V-Wave Medical, the interatrial shunt device by Corvia, the atrial flow regulator by Oculotech, and the levoatrial atrial to coronary sinus shunt by Edwards Life Sciences. Each of these devices has been limited to first in human and early feasibility studies with ongoing large randomized clinical trials for clinical outcomes. So the question remains, atrial shunt devices, will they work? And I think that largely depends on what outcomes we're looking at. First and foremost are hemodynamic goals. The primary goal is to decrease the wedge pressure and the resultant pulmonary venous pressure load. This should improve dyspnea for patients and improvements in quality of life. We also hope that there's little or no change in right atrial pressure or RV volume load, and we target moderate changes in QPQS so that long-term, there's no hemodynamic consequences on the right ventricular sy system. Secondarily, we can look at symptoms. Ultimately, these changes in hemodynamics are designed to improve symptoms for patients. We can look at improvements in quality of life scores. We can look at differences in six-minute walk tests. And we can look at differences in reported New York Heart Association functional status. Finally, probably most importantly, are the heart outcomes. Will these shunts improve heart failure admissions or reduce the risk of death for our patients with heart failure? So I'd like to share with you guys some data that we published earlier this year in JAK Intervention using the Edwards Life Sciences device. Eight patients, six patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and two patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction underwent implantation in a compassionate use program. In follow-up, hemodynamics improved with an average drop of nine millimeters of mercury at resting wedge pressures. There was no differences in right atrial pressure observed and the delta QPQS measured on invasive hemodynamic assessment was a increase of 0 0.25. In these patients, symptoms improved two-thirds of patients had a significant increase in their KCCQ questionnaire. Similarly, six-minute walk times improved, with nearly half of patients having a significant increase in their six-minute walk time. Finally, most patients were able to achieve functional class 1-2 status, with all patients being baseline class 3-4 and meeting criteria for compassionate use. Obviously, in the small cohort, we are unable to comment on heart failure admissions or risk of death long-term, with a median follow-up of six months.
certainly our findings are congruent with the published experience of interatrial shunt devices in the literature. These devices decrease wedge pressure, moderately increase six minute walk times, improve functional status, but have had no real effect on NTB and P levels. So at least in the short term, I think the preponderance of data supports that we will likely meet our hemodynamic goals and may even meet our quality of life goals. However, the real question is what happens to heart outcomes, specifically heart failure admissions and death. Moreover, we need longer term data to help us understand the impact on the right ventricle and pulmonary artery pressures long term, the risk of right to left embolism in these patients, and the loss of interatrial septal access for procedures that we perform in patients with heart failure, such as mitral clip, left atrial pressure monitoring, and left atrial appendage occlusion. Really, we need good randomized clinical trial data in patients with HEFPEF, HEFREF, at different stages of disease with proper blinding and adequate power. And hopefully we'll be getting some data coming from the reduced LAP heart failure 2 trial using the interatrial shunt device from Corvia, which is a large randomized clinical trial with over 600 patients looking at these hard clinical outcomes. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions by email that you may have.